Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Knight Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. Welcome back, everybody, to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, James Cable, and I'm here still live at the Davis County Public Library inside the Kentucky Room. But I'm here with Kathy Heflin Olson uh, uh, from the Owensboro Museum and Science Owensboro History and Science Museum. Museum of Science and Museum History. of Science and History. Okay, I, I, I just about got there. How are you doing today, uh, Kathy? I'm good, Jason. Thank, How are well, you? Good. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the museum and all the good stuff it uh, good. Has, to, uh, has to offer the world and right. the state in uh, general. Um, we are live on Facebook and YouTube, so you can uh, comment on there. And we can, if you have any questions, um, you know, let us know. Um, you can subscribe to the channel on YouTube as well. And if you're watching from the Davis County Public Library Facebook page, um, you know, ask some questions as well. And uh, so that, that's about the spiel, I guess. But I always like to ask the guest, um, what's your connection? Uh, have you been here your whole life? How's all that stuff go? Well, I was born and raised in Owensboro. Mm -hmm. um, I moved away for a while, but uh, returned uh, right before our son was born and brought my Minnesotan husband with me. Uh, <laughs> that's the name Olson. Uh, 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 my family has been in Kentucky. Uh, part of them were in Kentucky in the 1770s. Uh, the rest of them moved in, uh, immigrated just after the Revolutionary War. Most yep. of them Revolutionary War veterans that, that moved into Kentucky with land grants and um, uh, from North Carolina, Virginia. Yep. Yeah, I know um, you say 1770 and instantly questions start going off in my yes. head. You know, we think in Boonesboro, Harrodsburg, where exactly? There is a Boone connection, yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's always cool. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit. I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Owensboro Museum of Science and History, uh, founded in 1966, uh, located in downtown Owensboro. Um, Housed, housed within an historic 19th, 20th century building. Uh, I got that from the website. Yes. Is that, is that, a... that sounds familiar, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what, what uh, tell us about the history of the, the 
where did the museum start and how it got started, that sort of stuff? Well, it did begin in 1966, mm -hmm. uh, or was founded in 1966. Prior to that, uh, our founding director, Joe Ford, had uh, artifacts and specimens in a garage that a lot of people, myself included, would visit from time to time in the community. And the mm -hmm. Owensboro Public Schools uh, were very interested, uh, both the uh, superintendent at the time, Dr. Kenneth Estes, yeah. and uh, a biology teacher, Maurice, um, um, and oh gosh, I know his name, I can, uh, um, Hinton, Maurice yeah. Hinton. Uh, they were really interested in starting a, a museum for the students in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, it was actually founded with a national uh, defense education grant that was sponsored through the Owensboro Public Schools okay. and uh, with the purpose of creating portable exhibits that would be transported uh, to the school that we would transport them to the schools. Yeah. And in addition, there was a small, a very small physical structure on Sycamore Street um, and um, that housed a lot of cases, a lot of artifacts originally from Joe Ford's collection, but then also, the community started donating artifacts and specimens and documents, mm -hmm. uh, textiles, what have you, very quickly. And I think we took in about 3,000 artifacts and specimens uh, in, in 1966 alone because the community wow. really responded to the founding of the, mm -hmm. of the museum. My father um, worked at General Electric, but he had a hobby of collecting. He had many hobbies, but, but he had a hobby of collecting shells. And... Uh, actually had placed some of the shells that he had collected within the, he placed them in the museum and would volunteer on Sunday afternoons, and I would tag along. I was 11 years old at the time. Uh, so I, am, I remember that original structure and uh, what it looked like, and mm -hmm. um, I was very busy on the weekends. I had a little mini port planetarium that you could duck under and go in yeah. and see the stars. So uh, from there, uh, we moved to the is when the once real uh, uh, public library moved from Frederick Street, the Carnegie Building, uh, to Griffith Avenue, the museum went in and and uh, was there for about three years. Mm -hmm. um, the what is now the Art Museum then moved in, and um, we actually were housed in the basement of Kentucky Wesleyan College oh. for several <laughs> years while a, uh, a facility was being built just for the museum on South Griffith. A lot of people in Owensboro remember that museum, especially um, it was uh, it was actually built for the museum and uh, it was about 30,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started my tenure with the museum in, in 1960, mm -hmm. 1986. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, going with your father for those you know, on, the, on the trip and stuff. And I always, uh, the early connection, and I mentioned this earlier with, with Barry, that, you know, it kind of one of those things that hook us, but I, I always share, and I, I will probably share this till the day I die, uh, a few years ago, after COVID hit and all that sort of stuff, but things started opening up. I think my, my son, my, my oldest daughter, and my nephew to Fort Herod. And just, you know, one of those opening times, you know, it was a good time, good trip. They, they had a great time, but I took a picture at the end and they were, they were standing by one of the little monuments and my my uh son and my nephew they've got guns and they're posing you know, like, yeah. and my daughter is sitting on the monument like this and i'm like that that tells that that explains the day the boys loved it my daughter yeah she's not so much she's not you never know yeah, you yeah. Know, 60 years from now she <laughs> might she might be telling well, people stories about it <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll brag on her now she, she does know she's she's a third grader now but she does know all the presidents yeah, in the united states go. now so wow. i guess I, I saw that picture and i was like i gotta change this she's gonna start liking history yeah, you know that's right yeah um, well, you know, if you take your children to historic sites, that's mm -hmm. one of the best ways yeah. to get them interested yeah. in, in history. So you, you've done yep. you've done a good job. And that's that's well, exactly what my, my mom did with us. Yes, you know, me right. and we that's went right. to those forts. Um, what is like if you well, you mentioned this, too, about portable uh, stuff. Does that still happen? You all still get portable museums or exhibits, I guess, is a better way to we, say. We have slowly uh, moved away from that, mm -hmm. although we, if the school calls and, and asks for particular artifacts yeah. or documents or what have you, uh, we will take them to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we often have, we have an education collection mm -hmm. of, say, rocks and minerals and fossils that we share with the schools. So we do a little bit of that, but it's mostly... Um, Good. Good. I think. There we yeah. go. Is that a robocall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I should. I guess I should have turned off. I don't know if you can turn off cellular, but you know, yeah. anyway, go ahead. Uh, so now we're just mostly mostly a static structure, although we do have other programs in my head we did in mm -hmm. accounts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, does the uh, does the do you get like I know some museums will get specific exhibits for a while, mm -hmm. a certain amount of time. Does that still happen? Do you get like you know like uh, there was the traveling. Vietnam. Right. Uh, we have had quite a few traveling exhibits, dinosaur exhibits, um, uh, Civil War exhibits, uh, uh, magic exhibits, uh, dinosaur exhibits, <laughs> which are the most popular. Um, uh, we've had quite a few uh, traveling exhibits during our tenure, especially at our new site. Yeah. Let's see if I can turn off. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. All right. All right. We, we should be good now. Go ahead. Um, uh, you said uh, the traveling exhibits. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We. Uh, they are expensive. Uh, uh, we. They. They are usually designed for larger museums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it's that of course. No one has had much of a traveling exhibit or had much in the way of new exhibits the last two years. So we're looking forward and as we come out of the pandemic to um, getting back to some of those special features. What is what is the one thing you like the most about the museum or the one exhibit, if you want to say uh, artifact, however you want to say it? What's the one thing you, you think is the coolest? That's really difficult. <laughs> I'm a biologist, so I sort of tend towards the natural history in some ways. I think the passenger pigeon that we have mm -hmm. is uh, uh, perhaps the most interesting, followed by our Colombian mammoth mm -hmm. in the mammoth uh, fossils that, that, that we have. Mm -hmm. um, Passenger pigeons, probably they were definitely the most prominent bird in North America uh, in uh, prior to the 20th century, uh, and possibly the most common prominent bird in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in a less than a hundred years, wow. we hunted them to extinction. <sighs> wow! Uh, we had lots of passenger pigeons in this area. Um, lots of anytime you hear a community's name with pigeon or roost, uh, you can be sure that passenger pigeon, like Little Pigeon Creek, where Lincoln uh, grew up as a boy across the river in Spencer County, named for passenger pigeons. Uh, I mean, you can just you can look at all over the North mm -hmm. American map or especially the eastern half of the United States. Um, there are lots of communities that that are named for. Uh, the phenomenon of passenger pigeons either roosting there or you know yeah. in some yeah. some connection um they the the references in historical literature uh, uh and records about passenger pigeons i mean you're talking about eating squab you're talking mm -hmm. about um eating pigeons and it was passenger pigeons yeah. i mean um the the impact that that bird had uh First for the settlers, and then and then on the 19th century America, it's just yeah. pretty phenomenal. And uh, one of the last passenger pigeons to be um, uh, shot and killed it, that is in the Smithsonian uh, Natural History Museum. It was actually from Davis County. Oh, wow. and and <laughs> the family, the Taylor family, uh, is still on that farm. It's not necessarily wow. the the. Uh, remembrance that you want that your your family killed one of the last <laughs> one. It wasn't the last ones in captivity yeah. in the wild yeah. I, I should yeah. say okay. right right yeah. Yeah, that's another thing that's that's really interesting about that is that the last passenger pigeon that died her name was Martha mm -hmm. in 1914 they were she was housed in the Cincinnati Zoo her partner her male partner had died a couple of years previous and she stopped vocalizing after he died mm -hmm. uh, and two years later she died but they on they know almost the precise Mm -hmm. You know, within the hour, they know when that that species became extinct. Yeah. There's just a lot of interesting things yeah. about it. And so uh, we have we have we do have stories of passenger pigeons here in Owensboro. John James Ottoman, in a trip from mm -hmm. Henderson to Louisville, I think 1815, he recorded in his journal that the skies were dark for three days as if a storm were coming yeah. in. It was just from passenger pigeon. Wow. Uh, yeah. It was it was um, uh, there was a very common uh, uh, 
sort of observation by mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. it tells you how many there were that's a lot yeah so i think that's an important um if from a natural history history perspective there's an, and as far as uh, um environmental um uh, issues and protection and what have you, the passenger pigeon helps tell us tell, helps us tell mm -hmm. the story from the historical perspective. It's just almost endless as far yeah. as the number of ways that you can approach it. The wow. development of the train of trains mm -hmm. and telegraphs actually sped their demise because uh, people would spot large large roosting sites of pigeons they would telegraph the site and the trains would oh, go to them and they would they, you know they yeah. people use the meat uh, mm -hmm. the feathers for um, uh, uh, hats and decorations and what have you the, the fat from them was used for oils for different purposes but um but the technology really was not their friend <laughs> um but there are all kinds of stories so i really yeah. that that specimen is That's really cool. important to uh, me um <clears throat> We have some amazing historical documents that, um, mm -hmm. whether it's for, from Joseph Hampton Davis mm -hmm. um, uh, or uh, some of the early stores in the, the early, 1803, 1805, um, uh, a day book from an early um, uh, dry goods store, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, a document, this again is a D Joseph Hampton Davis document, appointing him the um, a common, or he was the U.S. attorney. Yeah. For Kentucky, yeah, and assigned by John Adams, well, yeah, and John well, Marshall. I mean, it's so. the whole burr stuff you can get right. on that. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> that, that gets into a whole whole yeah. array of stories yeah. which we have done. Mm -hmm. So, we have a cane of Joseph Hamilton Davis. Oh, um, but you know, so those are some of the the larger uh, uh, travel paths yeah. given to Josiah Henson so that he mm -hmm. could move back and forth um, within the community. So y'all open today? I mean, that might need to be my next stop. Yeah, <laughs> we are. I, we are. I would have to. They those none of those are on the exhibit at the moment, but oh. uh, uh, I can pull them for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that, uh, that's very yeah. interesting stuff. Um, but, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, but really, when it comes right down to it, whatever mm -hmm. artifact or document you pull, that becomes your favorite because the stories that are behind that, the yeah. everyday stories that are behind yeah. that oh. object are just as important as those mm -hmm. the others that i mentioned yeah. and um so i think that's the thing that i like the most about the museum yeah. you learn something every day yeah you learn and if you're curious enough you can learn things that or you can ask the questions that lead to the next sort of exploration yeah and always with the understanding that that those individual stories mm -hmm. are the the important thing mm -hmm. um one thing i you know definitely looking through your uh, catalog on the website and so, so forth the uh coal mine gallery because mm -hmm. it's very stereotypical eastern kentucky coal that's what everybody thinks about but you know everybody completely forgets of the western coal fields and and, and coal in western kentucky so i mean what does all that encompass because i mean myself i'm uh, still probably a bit novice about it myself but you know <clears throat> well i i think most people are uh surprised to find out mm -hmm. that the first coal mine in kentucky was in western kentucky yeah. uh, close to paradise in muhlenberg county in 1820 yeah uh coal mining in kentucky starts in western kentucky it's very much a western kentucky story mm -hmm. um and um uh it's matter the the one of the first references that you'll find the um steam Boat, the New Orleans, the first steamboat to go down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh to New Orleans, stopped in Yellow Banks, mm -hmm. in Owensboro, to take on surface coal in December of 1811. Yeah. Uh, so there's a mention of surface coal, and it was it was actually close to Bond Harbor, where mm -hmm. our coal mine uh, gallery is is based. And mm -hmm. um, it um, it's interesting because that first New Madrid earthquake hit. Uh, while they were here, so mm -hmm. you know you get a you get sort of a uh, uh, deluge of historical events that are happening at the same time. But but um, the uh, uh, at Bond Harbor Hills, uh, uh, one of the triplets uh, actually started a coal mine yeah. out there and a tram line mm -hmm. from the coal mine to the Ohio River, which is the first train or tram line in uh, uh, west of the Alleghenies. Yeah. Uh, a lot of history out there. So we we were very interested in covering that history. And we had a, 
uh, a good friend and patron uh, that whose family, the, the Rudys, mm -hmm. had uh, one of the large mines out in Bon Harbor Hills. Wow. And a lot of the artifacts and documents, the maps, just a lot of material. Um, and we had a basement that was perfect for a coal mine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we worked al alongside with that family and uh, the Office of Energy Policy in Frankfurt uh, to create a coal mine that tells the story of coal mining in, in Western Kentucky and uh, specifically about how Davis County, Kentucky was self-sufficient with uh, coal production, electrical production yeah. around the turn of the 19th century. Yeah, well, yeah. it's one of those things people, you know, Forget or look over it completely. I, I mean, did. and you know, you had fourth grade, fifth grade history, Kentucky history, specifically right there. They say you know Western coal fields. That's right. And then right. It, it gets and we've got over. the fossils. If the mm -hmm. if those the in that that Pennsylvania era, if it didn't become coal, the fossils. Uh, that's that. Those are the only fossils you find in this area. Not alongside yeah. the river. Not in yeah. Owensboro. You have to go to the edge of Davis County. Uh, close to Ohio County to get away from the floodplain. Yeah. Uh, but those are coal, coal. plants yeah. that plants that yeah. became or fossilized rather than becoming coal. And mm -hmm. there was a times that I, I, you know, I don't know exactly. I, I, I read it. It's been it's been a year or so since I read it. But you know, Henderson and uh, Davis County and other counties were producing just as much, if yes. not more, than other eastern Kentucky counties. That's right. Counties. That's right. Well, um, Muhlenberg County. Uh, yeah, yeah. They held a world record. Yeah. Uh, um, wow. So it was it was it was a huge mm -hmm. operation. A lot of mostly family uh, uh, coal mines here in Davis County, yeah. Muhlenberg County, of course, mm -hmm. had had the company coal mines or what yeah. have you. But yeah. the whole Illinois coal basin in, in Illinois, mm -hmm. eastern Illinois, southern Indiana and western Kentucky. It's a huge coal producing area. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Um, well, anything else right off that uh, you, you would like to bring up about the museum? Uh, as far as, th well, I mean, hours, operation, so let me just, when we're, people can come. Uh, we're very happy to be fully open now. Mm -hmm. uh, we are open from uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and Sundays, 1 to 5, closed on Mondays. Um, we, we are uh, welcoming back our first school tours in two years next oh, cool. week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we are, we are completely open. Yeah. Uh, we are expanding exhibits. Uh, we have just added a few uh, uh, water tables and mm -hmm. are putting in some early childhood education exhibits that are coming in within the next year. Yeah. Uh, so there are new things for, for everyone to see. Yeah. And um, we, uh, we look forward to seeing everybody there yeah. at the museum. Well, um, that, it sounds, it sounds awesome. I, you know, I okay. always enjoy going to museums. I guess that's the you know, history yeah. nerd of myself, but you know, that's one of those things. Um, Kathy, uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, if there's, and you all have a web page. Uh, we I, well, I know you have a web page, we but do. Facebook, Facebook, all that page, good stuff. Follow our Facebook. We have a lot of activities mm -hmm. um, every weekend and, and planned for spring break in the summer yeah. as usual. Yeah. And uh, we collaborate. I know we're wrapping up here, but we collaborate with the Kentucky Room on a mm -hmm. wonderful project called Voices of Elmwood, which yeah. is uh, the last two weekends in September, the first weekend in October, uh, where we select 10 people from the past, from this area, mm -hmm. research their stories, oh, yeah. uh, write scripts, uh, costume and period clothing actors that come out and give a seven minute Chautauqua monologue. Chautauqua kind of all that kind of It stuff. is yeah. a Chautauqua, but, but you ride on a, on a wagon oh, type, cool. type trailer yeah. through yeah. and that's a very popular program. It's a great collaboration yeah. with the Kentucky room here at the library. And it's a, um, I mean, we sell out every year. It's yeah. just, it's, <laughs> and um, I think that program has, uh, it, it really brings history to life for yeah. all of us involved. And it really emphasizes those. Everybody has a story to tell mm -hmm. and how those stories are interconnected. And, yeah. and um, it gives us a chance to learn, learn. I have more questions than I do answers. <laughs> yeah. And that, that program is a wonderful yeah. example of, of answering some of those questions. Yeah. 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 Well, again, thanks for uh, coming on. And I uh, want to say thanks again to the Kentucky you, Room as, as well for hosting us. Um, if nothing else, uh, again, you can subscribe to the channel, go to the Facebook page, like the uh, Owensboro Museum of Science and History as well, and uh, we'll try to spread as much history as we can. So thanks Thank again you. for coming. Thanks Thank again you. for watching, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part 
of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Night Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable, once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.